Check to make sure that people are in the correct meeting because there's two meetings going on in the centre and if all of this looked not what you'd signed up for tonight, then you uh, can leave now. As you can see, we're presenting two sides of a very, very difficult, uh, uh, very difficult issue. We're, we're looking forward to an evening of enlightening, open, open and respectful discussion about this topic on social justice as it relates, relates to Israel and Palestine. Before I introduce our panel, I'd like to lay down some ground rules for the audience. We've come to hear the speakers present their views and to ask them questions, and there'll be a time for public Q&A afterwards. So we would request you to listen to the speakers quietly with no interruptions such as comments or, or clapping. Um, if at any time you become very emotional and feel the need to jump, out, jump up and yell up out something like, praise the Lord, or Barak Hashem, or Alhamdulillah, you're free to do that, but please go outside and do it on Swanson Street and then come back when you've overcome your, your urge. This is a rational discussion. It's not a football match. And there'll be time at the end to express your, your appreciation to the speakers. Is there anybody here who feels they can't abide by those rules? Could they please just stand up now and make themselves known? We'll give you a refund. Nobody. Good. Um, so I'd like to thank you in anticipation for this evening. We've got a very distinguished panel here tonight. Um, so starting from uh, uh, Yusuf over there, Yusuf Arimawi was born of Muslim parents in Saudi Arabia. Uh, he's a translator, a language teacher, a 3CR radio broadcaster and a campaigner on Palestinian issues. George Browning was born in the UK. He's a, a former Jackaroo, uh, ex-Anglican Bishop of Canberra and Goulburn, and author and president of the Australian Palestine Advocacy Network. Ron Jontov Hutter was born of Jewish parents in South Africa, where he was an anti-apartheid activist. He's also an author, a violinist and a psychologist. And Nadia Ghali uh, was born in Egypt of a Coptic family. She's an agricultural scientist, a librarian, a 3 Z radio broadcaster and a women's rights advocate. And I was born in Bankstown of Catholic parents and I went to the same schools as Paul Keating and I learned my table manners from him as you'll see tonight. <laughs> I also lecture in Islamic studies at the Melbourne School of Theology. So please give a welcome to the panel. To So the program will be as follows. Each panellist will have five minutes to present a statement which they've prepared outlining their views on this topic, social justice, Israel and Palestine. Uh, then we'll have a panel discussion. We've got some questions that we'll, we'll talk through and then finally you'll have the opportunity to ask questions from the floor. We'll set up microphones on the side and you can ask questions to the panellists. So we'll begin with our statements from the panellists um, and Ron, I'll ask you to go first. Social justice in Israel and Palestine is a montage of good and evil, of enlightenment and darkness. The society's level of its civilization is judged by the treatment of women, of children, prisoners, animals, minorities, gays, and press freedom. The Palestinian leadership has ensured they fail on every one of these. Not only is the Palestine government, Hamas included, trashed the human rights of their own people, but have developed child abuse into a grotesque art form. Civilized societies don't on their children. Palestinian leadership abuses them for, pra for propaganda headlines. It is, harder to, it is hard to find a greater abuser of human and children's rights than the Palestinian government. The depraved depths of evil, using children as young as 13 to blow themselves up, has no equal in the civilized world. Using small children as young as seven, of whom 160 plus were killed digging terror tunnels into Israel, whilst diverting generous international aid from schools and hospitals, reflects the leadership who love death more than loving their own children, as reflected by storing bombs and missiles in schools and clinics. Schools. How would you feel if the government forced you to keep bombs in your children's schools, your homes, your places of worship? Is this not the most perverse form of child abuse and exploitation? Bishop Browning, would you allow your church to store missiles and suicide vests? Would it not be criminal and immoral to put your own congregants in danger like that? Well, that's what the Palestinian government that receives our Australian aid does to its own people. Shame on anyone minimizing, apologizing, condoning, even reluctantly, these crimes on children while sanctimoniously talking about social justice. 
Where is your voice protesting such horror? Obviously using children as soldiers, as human shields and attacking Israeli civilians with missiles are all war crimes and completely against international law. Like Sydney, Tel Aviv has a huge gay parade each year. In contrast, gays are officially punished in Gaza by being thrown off the tops of high buildings. In the Palestinian-controlled territories, violence towards women is common. Honor killings by fathers and brothers are on the rise. Women are pressured to marry their rapists. And where is your voice, Bishop? In the Palestinian territories, religious intolerance is absolute. President Abbas declared that, quote, Jews with their filthy feet may not enter the Temple Mount, unquote. That's the holiest place to Jews. In Bethlehem and Gaza, the formerly large Christian population has mostly fled violence, killing and assaults on them. And where is your voice? Before the 1967 war, when Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank, were in Arab hands, they demolished all 58 synagogues. Prior to that, in the 1930s, they ethnically cleansed Judea of all Jews, including the holy city of Hebron, which had a 3,000-year-old Jewish community. The ancient Jewish gravestones on the Mount of Olives were used for building toilets. And where was your voice, Bishop? In 2000, Palestinian Arabs, Arabs demolished the, the Jewish holy site of Joseph's tomb. The murderers were hailed by the Palestinian government as heroes. And where was your voice, Bishop? The word Jew derives from Judea and the word Arab from Arabia. So we know who the genuine indigenous people are. The Jews are the Aborigines of Palestine. Yet the Palestinian government, bizarrely, denies any Jewish history in Israel, Judea, and Samaria. Jesus, the Jew, preached on the Temple Mount, and yet, Bishop, where was your voice when UNESCO passed an outrageous resolution denying Jewish history in Jerusalem? Apart from the Jewish king David 3,000 years ago, and the other Jewish kings that followed him, they insult the narrative of Jesus and his mission in order to promote their hateful agenda. Denying Jewish history also denies Christian history. And where is your voice, Bishop? In contrast, the 50 years that passed since 1967 signify the only time in history that all people, no matter whom, are free to worship how they wish in the holy city of Jerusalem. The recent Palm Sunday and holy fire ceremonies by Christian communities and pilgrims from around the world testify to that. The Palestinian government insists their future state be Judenrein, free of Jews. Every Jew is labeled a settler to be ethnically cleansed from a future Palestinian state. In Israel, you are free to build a mosque if you're a Muslim. Additionally, thousands of Palestinians, including Hamas and Palestinian leaders and their families, are treated each year for free in Israeli, in Israeli hospitals. The very same people whose mission is the annihilation of Israel. No other war zone in the world has such contradictions. With social justice, Israel is an example of a dynamic, multicultural society where human and children's rights are cherished, not trashed. All right, okay. Well, you can't accuse Ron of being anything like or ambiguous. Um, I think Paul Keating looks like a diplomat compared to that. <laughs> but I'll ask um, Bishop, uh, uh, Bishop Browning, you're the next person on the list, uh, to give your kind of response or your uh, statement. Uh, Bernie and friends, it's uh, very difficult to speak having heard what you just heard. Uh, difficult to speak because of the way it was put and the facts it distorts. It speaks of somebody who has never been, never been there, never been to the West Bank, never been to Gaza, never been to Palestine. My involvement here is when it began in the 1970s when I trained the Palestinian clergy in Australia. And I've been back to Palestine many times, stayed in their villages, stayed in their homes, stayed in the houses, and the statements you've just heard are unrecognisable to me. Unrecognisable. And I, in fact, the opposite is my observation. On the West Bank, it is terrible to see all the settlers with armaments. I've never seen an armament in a Palestinian home, ever, never. In a Palestinian home, I have never seen an armament. In the bombs? You're supposed to be quiet. Yeah. And this, this conflict 
is, is complicated for all sorts of reasons. It's complicated, as you know, because of religious history of three great Abrahamic religions. And here, we should be finding common ground, not emphasizing, uh, not setting up somebody else as hatred. I will not set up the Jewish community as evil because I do not believe they are. I'm being set up here as evil for reasons which are in entirely inappropriate and it's one of the most shocking speeches I've ever heard in my life. Shocking because it's wrong, not shocking because it's true. Shocking because it distorts the truth. This conflict is not about religion. I was recently in the, in the uh, parliament in Ramallah and I was taken by the Islamic politicians to the door of parliament in Ramallah and asked to pray for the parliament and for the Palestinians. Islamic people asking me, a Christian, to pray for them. You just heard a moment ago about the way in which Islam in, in the West Bank or amongst Palestinians is totally intolerant. Completely the opposite is true. And I was pleaded with to make sure that Western influence in Palestine is not further eroded by the West not supporting the Christian Palestinian community, as small as it now is, sadly. The, the difficulty is that there is one group of people who have economic privilege, one group of people who have land privilege, one group of people who have privilege of rights, another group of people who do not. If you are, live in, say, around Naples, which I've been to several times, and you live in Naples, and you're a Palestinian, you may be lucky for example, to get 20, 50 litres of water per day per person. This is your land, your water. On the hill outside are settlements. They water their grass. They clean their car with the water. They have 250 litres plus per day. If you're a Palestinian, the electricity may be on or it may be cut off, not because of the incompetence of the Palestinian Authority, but because of the way it is dealt with by the Israeli government and the Israeli occupation. I know from Ireland that when you actually cause some people to be uh, unprivileged and others privileged, then a religious flag is used in order to fly under the ideology of either side. And the, the problem in, the, in Palestine is not religious, is not religion. It is to do with economic, land, rights, uh, if you are, in, I've been, uh, Margaret and I were there just fairly recently, and we met up with one of the clergy that I trained who has a parish in the Galilee. And he is married to a Palestinian. He is a Palestinian, he is married to a Palestinian. But they actually have to get out of the car and separate when they go through every single roadblock because they, one was born in, in Israel proper and the other was not. They're treated differently because of where they were born. There is no equality. To say that Israel is the only democratic, just, and it shares the same values as Australia, either our values are wrong or theirs are wrong. In Australia, no matter who you are, you have the same passport, you have the same identity, you have the same rights of religion, the same rights of owning property, the same rights, period. That is not the case there. And I, I, if there is still grievance uh, over a long period of time in relation to land, property and rights, then that grievance um, becomes a frustration at the moment there are several hundred Palestinian children, some of them as young as primary school, who are held in jail in Israel, away from their, away, the parents can't visit them, legal represent, representation can't visit them. Would that happen in Australia? Of course it would not. And why are they there, these young children? Because they've probably thrown a stone at an army vehicle. Why do they throw a stone? Because because they are frustrated at their situation. A farmer has a, has a, 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 a no-go road separating his house from his land. What do you think he's going to feel about that? Day after day trying to get to his land and he can't cross the no-go area. The frustration felt is very great and that is the difficulty.
Okay, so you can see we've got two very clear kind of perspectives that are being offered here. Um, I should note that every person on this table has been has spent some time in Israel. Each one of us has been there, travelled through at different times, but obviously experienced different uh, different things. Um, so I'll ask Nadia if you'd like to go next, if you'd like to um, give your statement. I can go next. That's yep. not a problem. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, I just would like to say that I am neither a Jew nor an Israeli, and I am neither a Palestinian nor an Arab. I am an Australian Egyptian with my own views. And when I refer to Arabs or Palestinians, I'm referring to the leaders and governments that has let them down. What do Palestinians and Israelis want? Israelis want a recognized Jewish state with a true and lasting peace, and the same for the Palestinians. The Palestinians want a win in a zero-sum game. They win, the Israelis lose, simple, no win-win. Although the history is full with religious wars, the evidence of the Oslo Accords in 1993 was that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict was not a clashing religious war, but one over borders, yet, Palestinian religious and political leaders preach that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is part of Islam's internal religious war against the Jews, the internal enemies of Allah, the prophets, and it prohibits acceptance of Israeli existence. The first leader of the Palestinians, Haj Amin al Husseini, Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, Treating the Muslim war with the Jews back to the birth of Islam said, Arise, O sons of Arabia, fight for your sacred rights, slaughter Jews wherever you find them. Their spilled blood pleases Allah, our history and religion. In 1941, Hosseini joined hands with Hitler, both wanting expulsion from and abolition of Israel and its entire people worldwide. Hosseini and following leaders constantly rejected territorial compromise, wanting all of Palestine as an Arab state, except for the Jews who had lived in the Holy Land before 1914. There was to be no conciliation with the Zionists. The Mufti concludes, the verses from the Quran and Hadith prove to you that the Jews have been the bitterest enemies of Islam and continue to try to destroy it. Do not believe them. They know only hypocrisy and craftiness. Do not rest until your land is free of the Jews and all Islamic nations are obligated to assist in the war. All of the land between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, which includes all of Israel, is a religious waqf an Islamic religious trust. Any Muslim who surrender any part of Israel is damned to hell. Remember, all agreements with Israel are inherently temporary in nature and are signed only because of Israel's temporary balance of power advantage, an exercise of the kia or deception. The ultimate destruction of Israel is certain. Therefore, Social justice based on equality between the two peoples is, from the Arab point of view, impossible. Let's move on. Adela human rights claims injustice faced by Palestinians in Israel heading gaps in education and employment. It claims that there are large gaps in education and employment opportunities for Palestinian children and women citizens of Israel compared with their Jewish Israeli counterpart. They claim that due to the lack of provision by the state and its prioritizing of Israel Jewish citizen. It is pointed out that just 25% of Bedouin, three to four old uh, in the Nakab, attend preschool. And the employment rate among the Palestinian women in Israel stands at just 25%. The Palestinian female employment rate is significantly higher than the female labor force participation rates in most of the world's 55 Muslim majority countries. 
The reason why 25% of women are working is because their men will not permit them to work or they don't want to work. The reason why more Arab Israeli women are working in Israel simply because they want to work and their men allow them to work. It is dishonest to accuse the Israeli government of preventing Palestinian women from doing something they don't want to do or their men will prevent them to do. I find it hard to listen to Arab complaining about being mistreated by the Jews. The Arab nations have a 1400 year history of oppressing Jews that continues up to today. In 1948, an estimated one million Jews lived in Arab lands, but these have reduced to few hundreds today. Social justice should apply to Israel as well as the Palestinians. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so our last one is uh, Yusuf, and Yusuf's going to respond. Thank you. We'll save our talking until the end. Thanks. Can I just have yep. some water? Yeah, sure. Um, um, uh, yeah, thanks. <coughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to have to cancel my statement and respond to... <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Uh, Free speech is what we're I will go ahead. Sorry. I'm yep. sorry. I would like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the elder past, present, on which this meeting takes place. And let me tell you that it's a matter of time when official meetings and ceremonies in historical Palestine will begin with an acknowledgement like this, one day. Before I start my presentation, I want to express my reservations on the religious categorization of the panel. I was born to a Palestinian family, Muslim. Course, but when William Nassar was the first Shaheed martyr, Christian Palestinian from Jerusalem after 67, when Edward Said was the most renowned Palestinian and Arab intellectual of the 20th century, when George Habash, Naif Hawatmi, Anis Sayyid, Constantine Zurek, Kamil Nasser, Omar Mahjoub, who happens to be a Copt, by the way, an Egyptian Coptic joining the Palestinian Revolution, and many, many other Christians, Palestinians, and Arabs were the leaders of the Palestinian Revolution and the society. I refused. To be, I refuse to invite religion to this discussion because it is not invited to the conflict. And I will introduce myself as a Palestinian only. <clears throat> to, speak, to speak about uh, social justice, uh, we have to understand that Israel created five systems that imposes on every Palestinian around the world, the 12 million plus Palestinians around the world. Domain one embraces the 1.7 million Palestinians who are citizens of Israel. From 1948 to 1968, they lived, under merita, uh, they, they, lived, they lived under martial laws, and to this day they are subjected to oppression on the basis of being not Jewish. The Israeli policy of marginalization manifests itself in inferior services, housing, education, access to jobs, and limited budget allocations. Israeli human rights organization Adal counted as many as 50 discriminatory laws against the Palestinians of Israel. The Palestinian political parties in the Knesset can campaign for minor reforms only uh, or better budget cuts, but are legally prohibited by the constitution, the Israeli constitution, from challenging the legislation maintaining the racial regime. The second domain covers the 300 plus the, the 300,000 Palestinians who live in East Jerusalem. Upon the occupation of the holy city of uh, Jerusalem, Israel treated the Arab Jerusalemites as entrants. To, uh, to their own city and gave them conditional residency permits. In addition to being discriminated against in nearly all aspects, the Palestinians of Jerusalem suffer from the policy of expulsions and home demolitions, uh, and, 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 uh, which serve the uh, Israeli policy of demographic balance in favor of the Jewish uh, residents. This places them in a separate category designated and designed to prevent their demographic and electoral weight to the Palestinians of Israel. Therefore, the social and political life of the Palestinians of Jerusalem is caught inside a legal bubble that prevents its, its inhabitants from challenging the apartheid regime lawfully. Of course, George spoke about the, occup the, the, the occupation, but I want to just uh, uh, highlight the report from the United Nation uh, from the United Nations Economic and Social Commission on, uh, for West Asia, uh, where it basically says that every uh, um, it says that except for one uh, one provision, which is the provision of genocide, West Bank is administered in a manner that fully meets the definition of apartheid under the Apartheid Convention of Roma. 
Every illustrative inhuman act listed in the convention is routinely and systematically practiced by Israel in the West Bank. Palestinians are governed by military law, while the approximately 400,000 plus Jewish settlers are governed by Israeli civil law. If this is not a, 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 a textbook for, for apartheid, what is, what is apartheid? And I will end with, uh, quickly, uh, uh, the, the, the two other domains. One domain for Gaza, because Israel has imposed she, uh, siege on uh, Gaza for more than 10 years now, controlling the entry and exit, uh, the imports and exports of Gaza. And of course, during these 10 plus years, they, uh, they launched uh, th three wars uh, that killed thousands of Palestinians and made la their life even more miserable. The, the, fifth, the fifth domain or system, it is the one that's affecting me, it's the one that's preventing, uh, that, that's stopping me from visiting my own country, Palestine. I, I have never been to Palestine, not because I don't feel like it. Uh, I wasn't allowed to be to Palestine, to my own country. And now that I have a foreign passport, which is Australian passport, I will be able to go as an Australian tourist. Isn't that uh, injustice? I will, I, will, I will also, today as we speak, there are more than 1,600 1600 Palestinian prisoners who are on mass hunger strike in protest of, of, of the inhumane treatment by the Israeli jailers. Uh, they, are, they are protesting medical negligence, they are protesting uh, access to lawyers, they are uh, uh, depriving them from access to their own lawyers. Uh, but I just want to give one example of Marah Bakir, the 15-year-old Palestinian girl who was taken to prison with broken arm and yet she, a, a year and a half ago, and she is yet to be treated in Israeli prison. Marah Bakir, not, write down her name and look up the information. I will end with a statement by Dr by the Palestinian historian Salman Abu Sitta, uh, who said that never before in modern history has a foreign minority descended upon the national majority of a country as in Palestine, depopulated its inhabitants, confiscated its land, property, and, and records in the largest land robbery since World War II, destroyed its historical and religious landscape, and obliterated its identity and history, and yet called this crime a victory for civilization and a divine intervention. I will leave it here. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Well, it looks like we've got some very clear uh, divisions amongst the, uh, the people on the panel, uh, a whole, uh, quite opposite perspectives, and you sometimes wonder if they're talking about the, the same place. So I'm going to do a little historical hypothetical with each one of the panellists. As you know, uh, Australian um, politicians fall into a, um, uh, a series of spectrums. Uh, and uh, the one that we're going to look at tonight is called the saying sorry spectrum. On, on the far left we have uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd who's very famous for his uh, we're sorry speech and on the far right John Howard who apparently never said sorry to anybody. So those are the two ends of the spectrum. And I'm going to put before you receive a phone call from a world leader who says, um, should I say sorry about this particular topic? Okay, so we'll start with you, Nadi. We, we do it in chronological order of That's the event. That's discrimination, really. <laughs> it's chronological order of the event, not of the panellists, <laughs> okay. I should point out. Um, imagine you receive a phone call from Egyptian President Abdel Fattah Hassisi. And he says, he's been asked to apologise to Israel for Egypt's enslavement by Pharaoh of the Israelites in the time of, in the time of Moses. Um, and he asks you, should I say sorry or not? Are you going to advise him to follow Kevin Rudd or John Howard? What, what do you think he should say? That reminds me of um, accusing the Israeli of the Tim Plague that um, affected Egypt during that time. Um, I would advise him to do what he feels correct to bring peace to the area, uh, whether to follow and say sorry. There is nothing wrong with saying sorry. If that will bring peace, I would say sorry. I've got no problems. No problems. Okay, good. Okay, all right, Ryan, you received your uh, phone call from uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, I'm sure rings you up every week. Um, and he's asked to say sorry for the, um, Israel's occupation of the land of Canaan under Joshua. <laughs> Uh, are you going to advise him to follow Kevin Rudd or John Howard? I would advise him to follow John Howard because saying sorry to the Canaanites, the Israelites when they came to Canaan, they actually were a light unto the nation because the Canaanites practiced a religion, they worshipped Moloch who loved child sacrifice. 
And um, that's at hover, at abhorrent in Jewish thought, culture, tradition, whatever. So it's strange for me to hear that, say sorry for that, especially when you think and you bear in mind that the Palestinian Authority today encourages the incitement of children to die or to be killed in um, suicide bombings or doing something that's going to harm their life. That is um, the only thing that's in common, and that's not our Australian way, it's not the Israeli way either, it's not the liberal democracy way anywhere on earth. Um, the Archbishop of Canterbury, who was actually in Palestine uh, last, last week. He was. He was. Did he, uh, he rings you up and he says, um, I've been asked to apologise to the Jews for the tens of thousands of people, uh, let's see if I can, yep, uh, um, tens of thousands of Jews uh, who were killed in, by Christians in the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition. What would you advise him? Say sorry or not? Well, yeah, I would, I'd, I'd advise him to say sorry, but I'd advise him to get his history right because as many Arabs were killed as Jews, right. and probably more Arabs were killed than Jews, and so he'd need to apologise to both. And I need to say at this point, Bernard, because it, my heart's pumping here, that I, I want to apologise to the Palestinian men and women in this, in this audience tonight who've actually heard xenophobic material about the, about the Palestinian people. Listen, we agree. It, it, it yeah. has been quite... Yeah, yeah, okay, now listen, we agree that we would not uh, give comments. If you feel the need to, co to comment... We, we've heard you terrible can, uh, things about okay, Palestinian yeah. women, how they... Tr how the, I, I, there are more women... Palestinian females with graduates from a university than almost any other Arab country in the world, and there are as many graduates, men and women, Palestinians, per head of population as there are Australians. The kind of thing that we're hearing tonight, the xenophobic material from here, is, is just shocking me, and I, I'm almost, my, my heart's pumping within me to hear I will not, I will not denigrate I will okay. not denigrate Israelis or Jews, and I don't expect Palestinians to be denigrated in the way that you seem to have the freedom to do it tonight. It's disgusting. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, okay, well, the last one that we get is Yusuf. Uh, so you get a phone call from Mahmoud Abbas, um, and he's asked to apologise for the, uh, what the Black September faction of the PL, PLO did in killing 11 Israeli uh, ath uh, athletes uh, in Munich in 1972. Um, Abu Mazen rings you about that. What would you say to him? What would be your response to that? Well, I don't think Abu Mazen uh, will ask me to apologize uh, on, uh, on behalf of the 9-11, or sorry, the Black September movement, because those who opened fire, yes, the Palestinians kidnapped the Israeli athletes, and they didn't want to kill them. It, the ones who really opened fire were the, the Israeli Mossads and the German, whatever it is. But, but I will not, I will not, listen, listen, listen. listen I will, I'm, not, I'm not going to be intimidated. Yeah, okay. And I will, I will say what I think is right. And you, I, I, I'm not sure if you're here with predetermined or you want to hear what we want to say. Yeah. If you really want to hear what we think, uh, I mean, you can, you can listen to me. All right. So uh, 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 there is nothing to apologize for. We are sorry that it happened this way, but yeah. it, it was not our our uh, end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Look, can I please remind people that we we did agree at the beginning. I laid down the rules, um, and if you still can't keep them, you can go to the back and get a refund and, and leave. But I would please ask you to control yourselves. And, and we realise this is a difficult topic. There's not many places in the world, and maybe not even Australia, where we can have this kind of freedom and openness that we're having tonight. And this is it's a great privilege. It's painful, but it's a privilege. Can I in so seconds? OK, I won't say. But so can people please make that commitment again to control themselves? Uh, outside afterwards, you can go out and say the things that you want to say. But today, from both sides, you're going to hear things that you may prefer not to hear. And one of the reasons I was, I was happy, I was invited to uh, take on this role. And I'm conscious, having uh, lived amongst Arabs for over 20 years uh, in different parts of the world, having visited Israel several times, I realised that often they're speaking in echo chambers that the, the uh, Israeli groups will say one thing, the Palestinians will say another, but they're not talking to each other. Tonight we get the chance to talk to each other. So please cherish that, listen, and you'll have a chance to ask your questions afterwards, okay? So please keep your comments until then.
Just in 10 seconds, if the Palestinians wanted to kill the Israeli athletes, why did they wait till day two? They could have killed them the moment they captured them. Okay, yep, yeah, all right. So, the, and again, all these things, these historical things are, are disputed and different things. I might take you back to continue with you, Yusuf. Yep. Um, this is a comment from um, the Sydney, oops, why is that not working? Okay, Sydney halal millionaire um, uh, Mohammed El Muelhi. Mm. Um, and in, on uh, the day after, um, Bok, uh, sorry, it's Anzac Day, he, he wrote this comment. Um, and in other contexts, in Palestine, both Muslim and Christians have lived in peace since the Crusaders were defeated till the European Jews decided to plant themselves there in the late 40s of the last century with the pretense that the grand Rialtor in the sky gave it to their ancestors thousands of years ago and it is theirs forever and a day. They dispossess the native inhabitants, torture them, imprison them and their children, treat them like animals who have no, no soul. It is where apartheid is practiced with impunity. Would you consider that to be a good summary of Palestinian history? No, it's not a good summary of Palestinian history. I, I agree with the last sentence. It's apartheid is practiced with impunity. Um, however, uh, religion is not an issue. I mean, uh, maybe the majority of the, of, of the audience today don't know that there is an Israeli in the Revolutionary Committee of Fatah. He was voted by a secular movement, Fatah, in 2009, and he's leading. He's leading. Uh, he's one of the leaders of Fatah. Uh, so he's not only he is not, not only is he Jewish, he is a, a sit an Israeli citizen. So if this is an issue of religion, why would we have Jews uh, on our side? And I want to also narrow the issue to politicians because. Uh, uh, we grew up uh, on 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 uh, human rights on, on human rights violations. I remember my my earliest memories about the Palestinian issue was an Arab series drama series. It's called Bi Ummi Aini with my own eyes, and it was uh, written based on a book by the Israeli human rights activist. Um, Venetia Langer, who uh, is a German uh, migrant to Israel and later became an Israeli citizen, she exposed the human rights violation. She was the first one before okay. B'Tselem. Right, right. so, we might just stop it there. So you made not, the comment it's not an issue. about... Yeah, okay. it, it's yeah, not sorry. an issue of religion. Um, yeah. um, you made the comment about the audience. The audience is not so, uh, selected. I, I actually sent invitations out to every mosque um, and every Islamic organisation in Melbourne, mm. uh, both by mail and by um, email. Uh, and and the Islamic Council of Victoria was also invited. So um, th there should be an, uh, a mixture of different people there. There were a whole lot of networks used. Sure. It wasn't just one group sure. that was invited. So that's, that's important to do. Um, maybe, George, we can move on to you. Um, we've got uh, a, the, the Balfour, Balfour Declaration. Uh, for people who don't know, it's written up there. Um, if uh, uh, His Majesty's... Whoops, I can't read it from down there. His Majesty's government... Uh, views with favour the establishment of Palestine um, as a national home for the Jewish people. Uh, we will use our best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this object. It will bring clearly, un it, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done uh, which will prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. Um, so that's um, the centenary of it this year. Um, the British Parliament actually was asked to apologise for this, but they refused. Do you think that was a good move? No, I don't think they should apologise. Um, people might be interested to read a book by the very uh, eccentric uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs in Britain, Boris Johnson. The book's called The Churchill Factor. And one of the, one of the things he says is that Churchill sold the same camel three times. And what he meant by that is that in 1917, in order to uh, head off the Ottomans and, and push them out and to stop a front getting down as far as the Suez Canal, he, he encouraged the, what was called the Arab, up, Arab uprising. And part of that deal was that post the war, the Arabs would have some form of, of autonomy or, or semi-autonomy. And uh, the Battle of Beersheba had to do with the Arab uprising. Um, and then the Balfour Declaration made uh, a promise in relation to a, a, a state for the Jews. And thirdly, he made a promise to the French. And of course, you know, after the war, the whole area was carved up with boundaries that were not set by the Arab people, the local people, but 
set by Europe, the, the boundary of Jordan, which is British, uh, Iraq, which is British, Syria, which is French, Lebanon, which is French, and Palestine, which was a British protectorate. So the, this year we're celebrating the centenary of the Battle of Beersheba, which had to do with, not with Israel, but had to do with the Arab uprising. We're celebrating the centenary of the Balfour Declaration. And, uh, and because the wider world has been so influential in causing or be setting up the situation which is such a problem in the world, the wider world has to be part of the solution. It's not simply possible for these two parties, one very powerful, one weak, to come to a negotiation between them. Between them, there has to be some involvement and pressure from the from the rest of the world, particularly from America, but also from Australia. Certainly, it's been a, a long um, and painful history of conflict uh, since that time. So the um, the first or the second world war intervened in that uh, period with the, the Holocaust, uh, and then we saw the. Um, a movement to establish the the state of Israel um, in uh, in the in the land there, and it's been a uh, and that's just a, a kind of a summary of some of the wars that have gone on, the big ones uh, uh, that got into the news. Why, Ron? Tell me why can't Israel and Palestine just get on? Why why is it always fighting? Why has it been this history of um, like a century of or more of uh, conflict? What's going on? Well, the first thing is that. Um there's been a lot of misrepresentation, what I've heard from, from you two gentlemen here tonight, unfortunately. Um, whether you like to acknowledge it or not, there's a lot of religion involved. Otherwise, Abbas would not say, I will not allow Jews with their filthy feet to enter the Temple Mount, which is their holiest site. He's also his forces have also murdered rabbis at prayer. They've crashed Joseph's tomb and murdered the rabbi and burned the prayer books. They've walked into a seminary and, and murdered... Um, seminary students, Jewish seminary students in the library studying. It's, it's been a long history, but it's not only about Jews. They've also um, killed Christians. Um, they've, they've got a history of not tolerating other people. Um, as far as the um, conflict is concerned, um, Jews have been the indigenous people of Judea, Samaria, and Palestine for thousands of years, thousands of years. If you look at the um, Palestinian surnames, for instance, they have got names that are Masri. Half of the Palestinians are called Masri, which means Egyptian. Many of them come from Saudi Arabia. Erekat comes from Saudi Arabia. His family is a clan from Saudi Arabia. They came in the last hundred years, mostly as itinerant workers, because they were good jobs. Um, many also came to Chile. In 1850, many of the Palestinians, Arabs, came to Chile and got good jobs. They came there and they've become a very, very vibrant community in Chile. There's half a million there. The fact of the matter is that they have never, never been able to live with anybody. That's, that's their leadership, because their leadership has incited them to murder all the time. Why, do they, why would you give people who murder Jews a stipendium of $30,000 a year. What kind of a society is that? What kind of a leadership is that? You've been misled. You've been misled. Because while Israel is winning Nobel Prizes, and that includes the advancement of the Arab communities in, in, in um, Israel, where they've got affirmative actions for, for Arab um, Israelis, where Arab Israelis are the deputy speaker of the parliament, they're commanders in the army, commanders in the air force, they've got diplomats, they're heads of Tamara of of departments in universities, heads of departments in the most prestigious Ministry hospitals. I'm talking, I'm talking, so you must uh, respect that as well. So when you talk about apartheid, me as an anti-apartheid activist tell you that you're totally misrepresenting it and it's mendacious. It's an insult to the black people who struggled under apartheid to be told that Israel's an apartheid. And it's not only me, it's also Reverend Kenneth Meshwe, who's a black um, pastor, there's also somebody like Lukosi, who's a young ANC. Okay, maybe we'll come back to that. The whole question nonsense. later on. I think, yeah, it's important. Uh, if, if we have statements like that, mm. there must be a response. response. I mean, okay, yeah, sure. We'll to two, yeah, it's all right. no, no, to two of the people who most it describe Israel as apartheid are Mandela and Tutu. Mm. And the experts <coughs> on apartheid. And I, 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 I'm not going to dismiss your activism for, for, as an anti-apartheid, but uh, there is a category that you might fall under uh, uh, that, which is PEP, progressive except in Palestine. So uh, PEP, progressive except in Palestine. 
So, so what's that middle word? Accept. Progressive. Yeah. Accept. In oh, Palestine. Okay, accept in Palestine. Yeah, okay, right. So yeah. this right. is okay. this is a so social the the this is a social phenomenon, yeah. and you can read about that, and yeah. you, you fit that category. The other point that needs to be said in counter what we just heard is that um, um, there is there, there, I've got a list of the members of the Knesset who actually describe. Um, Palestinians as less than human and that, it is, that it's possible to, to kill them morally and uh, that, that no land will ever be allowed be in their possession. Now there's about 12 members of the Knesset who've made statements like that. So if you're going to give quotes on one side then provide the quotes on the other and the reality is there are extremists on both sides. There are extremists on both sides but I would have thought that in a a group like this, we are wanting to look for moderation on both sides and to find middle ground on both sides and not to emphasise the, the extremists on both sides. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think what we're basically want to put all the views out there because even amongst the, the, the different sides, we've got uh, different perspectives that will come well, out this, and we'll talk about that There's no problem with views, yep. there's a problem with presenting facts. Uh, present, presenting lies as facts. Mm -hmm. And if we're going to waste the time refuting everything that, because I disagree with pretty much everything, and I have to say that I feel disheartened to see an Egyptian advocating for Israel. With, with, it's not personal. Mm -hmm. I don't know you, I, have, I, don't, I don't know you, I have so much respect for, are for you. you. Are, you okay. are you denying me my right to speak no, my no, mind? No, no, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that I feel, okay. I feel disheartened because yeah. the, well, maybe, the Egyptian maybe Coptic can... community, uh, the Coptic community of Egypt has mm -hmm. been, the, w w had, had, did not accept normalizing. Mm -hmm. the, with, with Israel, and we know that uh, the head of the Egyptian church, Baba Shnuda, rejected yeah. uh, the, uh, to allow the members of the Coptic church to do pilgrimage to Palestine in protest, uh, to uh, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. in protest of the Israeli occupation of Jerusalem. Okay, okay. I, might, know, I might just bring that in. That's, yeah. that's, okay. that's might... entirely his opinion, or was his opinion. It, was it, doesn't, it does not mean, it does not mean, I'm sorry Yusuf, <laughs> It does not mean that he imposes that on me. I am a Christian. I have, I have a mind of my own. Whatever I stated tonight was not lies. Thank you very much. Everything is textbooks. Everything is accessible to anyone. So before you accuse anyone of that it's being I'm lies, I'm, I can I'm, say I'm, the I'm, same about right. what you stated. No, 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 no. I've, I've respected the way you spoke and you need to give me my time too. Okay. Well, the fact, no, no. The fact, the fact that I am Egyptian. I did state that I am Australian Egyptian, and I'm proud to be Australian. I'm not going to say I'm only Egyptian because I owe this country a lot. I left Egypt because of the way the Christians are being it's not treated. Personal, However, it's not that's personal. not the subject here. But you're mm -hmm. so, uh, Nadia, anyway, anyway. Can, can I just uh, jump in? Uh, a couple of times, Nadia, um, when I thought you presented your perspective as though um, it's really just an, an issue of religion. Um, and I think both of you have, have challenged that, that Absolutely. even if religion has got too much to, don't you think it's, isn't it a bit simplistic and reductionist to say, well, this is all just about um, Israel versus Judea uh, sorry, um, Judaism versus uh, Islam? With all due respect, if we actually take the religion out of the equation, I'm sure that both parties would have reached an agreement. Simply the fact that the leaders of the Palestinians, and I made it very clear at the start that when I address Arabs or Palestinians, I'm actually talking about the leaders. The fact that they incite that hatred for Jews it's a very obvious. It's, it's, let's take the religion. Let's mm -hmm. take the religion. And, and I'm sure that both parties will sit down. You have been offered, or the Palestinians have been offered so many opportunities to have a land, but they knocked it back. I need to know why. Can I answer well, maybe, why? Maybe, yeah, actually we can talk about that. There have been a whole series of failed peace plans. So Yusuf, why do you think, it, and you see uh, everyone's willing to shake hands in front of an American president, no matter where they come from, but so why do you think the, the peace plans that have been presented over the decades well, first have all, failed? First of all, let's, let's, let's not give the illusion that the last 25 years were the year, at, uh, with 25 years of peace and negotiations. Mm -hmm. Yes, there, it started with peace accord. It's not even a mm -hmm. peace treaty. Uh, Oslo Accord is uh, an elementary uh, draft. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, during the, the last 25 years, Israel continued the occupation of West Bank. 
continued the expansion of settlers of settlements in West Bank and, and in Jerusalem, and also continued to the, treat the Palestinians in the West Bank as subhuman and to treat the Palestinians in Gaza uh, the, the same way. So what kind of, if this is peace, how would non-peace look like? So that's the first, the first point. Second, the offer that what the, 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 the last offer I remember was the uh, year 2000, it's 17 year, 17 year old, which is the Camp David negotiations. Mm -hmm. And the offer uh, which was made by the Americans, not by the Israelis, uh, and uh, they say that Arafat rejected it, but it did not include Palestinian sovereignty on Jerusalem, and it did not uh, include the Palestinian right of return. And no Palestinian leader would accept any, any offer that doesn't have these two. Mm -hmm. And therefore, let's not be delusional and give the wrong has been peace, and the Palestinians didn't accept it because they just like to kill Israelis. That okay, is totally you, untrue. I'll, I'll just, um, you brought up the question of the settlements, and I'll put this one to Ron. Um, uh, the recent resolution of the UN Security Council 2334 condemned Israel's illegal settlement building on the West Bank. Um, surprisingly, the Americans actually got behind that one and voted for it. Australia um, they abstained. Did, ab sorry, abstained. Sorry, yes. They, they, surprisingly, they abstained. Um, Australia actually um, broke ranks with it, um, and that was quite. So why, why does Israel persist in building these settlements, although they realise that it's a serious roadblock to peace? Well, I think that there are a few issues here involved. The first thing is that this whole thing about occupation is, um, has become very emotive. Um, firstly, the so-called occupation or liberation of Judea um, and Samaria, the way you want to put it, um, happened after Jordan, which had illegally acquired through force that area in 1948, and then started another war in 1967, and Israel was the only country, in, I think, in world history that begged to give back the land in exchange for peace. And the, um, the Arab nations, Jordan, Egypt, none of these countries were going to accept that. For them, peace is not the issue, because they said in 1968, no negotiations, no peace, no recognition of Israel. That's basically stood since then. You've also misrepresented about the occupation as well, because in, under international law, a state uh, an occupation is when one state occupies another state. But this is not a state. It was an area that was illegally occupied by Jordan and which they lost in a war that they started. Secondly, as far as the settlements are concerned, um, that's also been misrepresented by you because in fact they're really neighborhoods of, um, of Greater Jerusalem and they, they satellite towns of, and neighborhoods of Jerusalem, and they are less than 2% of the entire... No, Can I'm I ask finished. you? Can I, ask I will you? finish. Mm -hmm. You must just respect me. On this okay. point. No, yeah, no, because you're finished. Let me okay. finish, yeah. Because I know that no, in, in Palestine, you disagree with the government, you go to jail. Mm -hmm. But in Australia, we do listen to other people's points of view. Drama. Thank you. And um, what happened is that um, those settlements or neighborhoods um, are less than 2% of what the West Bank is. In fact, the Palestinian Authority, the Palestinian government, rules 98% of Palestinian people. They've got their own um, soldiers, their own, their own um, paramilitary, which is armed by the Americans and trained by the Americans. They've got their own universities, their hospitals. They've got their own institutions, their own press, their own jails, which are full as well. And also, um, they run their own country. And the problem and the, and the tragedy is, the tragedy is that it's not about the settlement. Because Israel froze the settlements in order to try and get the Palestinians to come to make a peace treaty. But they won't do it because these guys are all, all running, crying to the bank. They've, they've made victimhood into a business, into a very lucrative business. It's not by accident that one of the wealthiest people in Israel happens to be a Palestinian just outside Ramallah, Mundib al-Masri. He's a multi-billionaire. Mm -hmm. okay. What kind of refugee is that? Oh, okay, Another. maybe yeah, just if you want to respond. Well, can I quote uh, an Israeli columnist? Yeah, sure, go for it. Who is a writer at Haaretz, uh, Giron Levy. <laughs> and he reminds me of what, in fact, I remember, I'm, I'm glad I had uh, this print out with me because he exactly talks about what we are here uh, seeing t uh, tonight and I quote the Israeli society has surrounded itself with shields with walls not just physical walls but also mental walls 
There are three principles which Israel lives by. One, all Israelis deeply believe that they are the chosen people. Then they have the right to do what they want. Uh, that, that's not my words. Mm. This is published in Haaretz. Number two, never in history has the occupier presented himself as the victim. And not only the victim, but the only victim around that is in Israel. We are the only victim in the Middle East. Number three, Israel has, Israelis have undertaken the systematic dehumanization of the Palestinians. And this allows Israelis to live, to live with everything around them in peace because the occupation doesn't involve question of human rights. It's half an hour drive from Tel Aviv to the occupied territories and they know, they either don't know, they either don't uh, uh, want to know, or they either uh, don't care what's happening half an hour away from their homes. And because of these three characteristics that Gideon Libya, an Israeli Jew, uh, 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 spoke about, and what we see here today is actually a very good reminder. Mm -hmm. And I also want to come back to the point that was made that uh, the, the, the settlements are just neighborhood, peaceful neighborhood. When you say neighborhood, I feel like, you know, like Richmond and suburbs and uh, 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 as if there is no settlements in Hebron and Nablus and Jenin, as if there's no uh, settlements in Tulkarim, as if, uh, let's, let's say that Jerusalem, you know, let's put Jerusalem aside and you know that the, uh, the settlements in Jerusalem is not like the settlements in West Bank where it is the settlements on the top of the hills, it's pocket type of settlements where they just occupy a, an apartment in a building or maybe, the, or, or, or maybe the roof of a building. So I don't think that your representation of settlements is accurate and okay. um, there's a lot to respond to but I, I don't want to... I just jump, jump on to another topic. Um, this is, um, no, uh, this one's here for you, um, Bishop Browning, you're a strong supporter of the boycott, divest and sanctions movement. Um, whoops. Jump past that one. Um, last month, a young Jewish woman was refused service in a cold steel piercing um, parlour in Cairns. When she went to ask for uh, a price for a nose piercing, she was asked where she was from. And when she said Israel, he pointed to the, spot, the uh, sign on the wall which said, no Israelis served here. Um, and he would not serve her out of principle. Do you think this is a valid uh, expression of B the BDS movement? Uh, you, you said I was a strong supporter. Yeah, um, I've, I've seen your stuff on the internet. Yes. Well, let, let me explain my stuff on yeah, the internet. Good. Yeah, good. Mm -hmm. um, we just heard from Robert about uh, the occupation and that it's not really an occupation under international law. That's entirely wrong. The international law is the agreements that are set through the United Nations and its agencies. And according to the United Nations, the occupied territory is an occupied territory. And there are three things that have to happen with an occupied territory. Number one, that the occupier looks after the civil rights of the occupied. This does not happen. It's the, actually the reverse. The settlers are looked after, and it's actually the, the, the occupied who suffer. Number two, um, I'm losing my track here. Um, the, uh, Maybe they could uh, evacuate, transfer people. leave the land. Oh yes, number two, you're not allowed to, you, you're not to move your own civilian population into the occupied territory. That is why under the United Nations, all settlements are illegal. All settlements are illegal. Not under Israeli law, but under United Nations, all settlements are illegal. And thirdly, you must withdraw from the occupation as soon as it's feasible to do so. So, um, uh, the... Because this situation is, is, has gone on now, obviously, for 50 or more years, in this situation, what are you to do? Are you to, are you to lie down and take it? Should you resist violently? Or can you, or, I'm answering it. Or, can you, or should you resist non-violently? Lie down and take it. Um, I don't think anybody in this room would think that if you're oppressed, you should lie down and take it. Probably no, no, there are some people in the room might think you can resist violently, but the Palestinians rightly, and from a Christian perspective, I believe, you can't resist violently, therefore you're left with a non-violent resistance. And BDS, BDS 
is, a, is a, non, a form of non-violent resistance. My support for BDS is from those companies and activities that profit from the occupation, not from Israel overall. Okay, so you wouldn't support this because this young Israeli girl was prevented from have, receiving a service? Well, I don't, know, I don't know enough about that to say whether I would or I wouldn't, but I... I <laughs> oh, thanks very much. <laughs> I, I, I've just given you a very clear answer that, that if you are occupied, you have three alternatives. The only one that's acceptable is non-violent resistance. And I think that would be recognised by most in this audience. And if you actually deny people non-violent resistance, you push them into violent resistance, which is the last thing the world needs. Maybe I can just ask Ron to respond to the, the, the BDS thing. Um, yeah, the point yeah. I First thing I want to just say very quickly that... Um, um, your views on occupation and international law are totally wrong because your views are, have been contradicted by international professors of law, Jacques Gautier of Canada, um, Avi Bell, Alan Baker, um, Kontorovic. Um, there, there are many, many uh, top international jurists who will disprove what really. you're saying, number one. Number two, just not so long ago, a few years ago, the Versailles it's in a um, court of appeal, of high appeal, also said that it's not an illegal occupation. So I think that you've really got your facts wrong. It's not what the United Nations says, because the United Nations, everybody knows, is run by a bunch of thugs and, and kleptocracies, not democracies. Everybody knows that. Now, as far as the BDS you can't is win concerned, argument simply I just by want to denigrating I want, people. I want yes, to, yes. Denigration is I, not an argument. I gave you the names of, of jurists who do not agree with you, and because they don't All agree with you, Israelis. it doesn't mean that I can't present them, and I will present them. You really are out of step, and you're also out of step with with the um, Archbishop of Canterbury. He's in Israel at the moment, and he's just said just a few days ago, Israel is a gift. He said Israel is a gift. Those were his words. Being and in favour of Palestinians is not being against Israel. I, I, I'm in favour of Israel. I'm not against Israel. Yes, but, but everybody knows that Israel's neighbours have a genocidal agenda. Everybody knows that because their people are told that. And you pretend that you don't know it. I know it. A child would know it. And as far as, the, the, um, as, far as you are concerned, Yusuf, when you talk about apartheid, Israel, let me I tell you... I don't talk about it. You do? This is the reality. This is the United Have Nations. Have you ever been in South Africa during apartheid time? The United Nations. I'll ask you a question. I, I, was, I was young. <laughs> You're not letting me finish. You're okay. not letting me finish. Right. Listen, what we might do, we, um, uh, well, I want to get questions from the floor. I just, I, I just um, want to say one thing. Okay, yeah, I'll, just while we're organising this, I'll let you um, uh, both continue your uh, yeah, yeah. genteel discussion. Um, Can I just maybe, say one thing? So the, um, where, who's got the microphones? There's two microphones. There, there should be one on either side. What I'd like you to do is to line up behind the microphones. Okay? So, go up, maybe if we could have one microphone over that side and one on this side. It's going to be questions if or statements. If you have a question, um, people can line up and ask. And I, I do want you to ask a question, not to make a statement, okay? So, what happens is um, if after 30 seconds I'm not hearing, uh, I'm not expecting a question mark, I'll cut you off and pass it to the next person. Okay, so please do that. Um, line up and uh, yeah, we'll just finish this discussion and then we'll go to some. As far as okay. the BDS is concerned, yeah. I just want to make a very quick um, remark that the BDS is, is not going to make any bad, bad, you know, major damage to Israel because it's not going to, to really do much. Uh, it really hurts the Palestinians more than I think the, than the, um, than the Israelis because a lot of them have lost very, very good jobs. But as far as BDS is concerned, is if you want to have a need to have a boycott, um, I think the need to boycott is the Palestinian leadership that has trashed the hopes and dreams of their children, that has brought up a, an entire generation based on, based on hatred, that's got a generation, a leadership, that has stolen millions and millions and gone laughing all the way to the bank on other people's tears, that has kept its people in camps, unnecessarily so, and that's also um, how paid money, how big money. Just well, how, how, explain, please. How did our, how did our leadership keep, uh, keep our people in camps? Well, let me tell you one thing. How? You know, you might not be, it's not a question of religion. So is it, okay, can, you finish. Finish. can you tell us they, they kept us there? Give me the, I know that in the country no, that you support, me. Me. that you can't have free speech, you end up in jail. But this is Australia, it's different. So let me finish. No, there, were a million, there were almost a million Jewish refugees from Arab countries, including the Fahud in Iraq. They came to Israel as refugees. They were in tents. 
in horrible overcrowded tents and they were there till they were taken out of the tents and put into housing from a very poor country that could only at that time produce Jaffa oranges. Okay. Today they produce so, so Nobel Prizes. It, you, Your countries, with all the oil, with all the political backing, with everything they've got, they keep them in camps. That's criminal. That's what you should be boycotting. Those people should be okay. boycotting. Can you clarify? Just, we, they keep them in camps? What are you talking about there? Why have all the... You're hundred, saying that we, we, we should be protesting our leaders because they kept us in camps. They have misled you. Because this didn't mean... You've been cheated. They have misled you. Oh, okay. 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 All right. Maybe, look, um, but can uh, I, Bishop Browning, can I just get you to respond? To, mm -hmm. There's this charge of corruption that... It's commonly made against the um, Palestinian leadership. Um, how, how do you see that thing? Is that, is that a real issue? Um, what's, what's your perspective on that? I'm not sure that I'm competent enough to answer that question. Um, I agree with that. Thank you, sorry. No, please keep you quiet. Yeah. Okay. Don't be intimidated. Sorry, yeah. on, sorry, he's giving you the bishop's stare, so there you go. No, I'm, just, I'm just finding some of this. Childish. Some of this. Some of this, well, childish is one way of putting it, yeah. <laughs> the reason why I'm not confident because I don't know enough about the politics of, of, uh, of, the, of the government there. But what I do know is that um, Palestine, the West Bank is divided into three parts, uh, areas A, areas B and areas C. And, and the Palestinian Authority has restricted uh, ability to govern its own people depending on which, re which of the areas it is. And, and uh, um, more or less Israel has total control is the area of Syria. Yeah. So um, it, it's very difficult for the Palestinian Authority to deliver, um, well it's impossible for them to deliver water to their people because that's controlled by Israel. Mm -hmm. Electricity is controlled by Israel. The mm -hmm. internet is controlled by Israel. And so um, one, of the, what, what, one of the things that happens with government or authority, if it actually is unable to deliver its, its uh, basic needs to its people, it becomes dysfunctional anywhere in the world. And uh, this is not to um, excuse, but I think, yeah, I think there is, there is a lot to be said about the dysfunction of the Palestinian authority. And, um, and there are many in Palestine who would be prepared to live in one state, in one state, uh, as long as one state that. meant a genuine democracy where there's freedom of, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of identity, freedom of property, etc., etc., etc. But uh, I, unless I read him wrongly, Netanyahu totally discounted any possibility of that ever happening under his watch when he was out. Okay, we, we're, we're fortunate that Donald Trump said he's going to sort it, um, yeah. the thing out, so <laughs> we won't need a meeting like this next place week. Place we might go to questions but, from the floor. But so maybe we'll just start. Down down okay. Do it, Sunday. No, no, no. Sorry, no, no. Can you control yourself, please? No, no, no. Can you have to listen. This is written by an Iraqi Jew. Okay. Naim bin Adi. You can read this book. I'll send it to you. I'll send it to you free. Ben-Gurion scandaled how the Haganah and the Mossad eliminated Jews by Naim bin Adi, an Iraqi Jew. And Naim says that I write this book to tell the American people and the world, especially the American Jews, that Jews from Islamic lands did not immigrate willingly to Israel, that to force them to leave, Jews killed Jews, and that to buy time to confiscate even more land, Arab land, Jews, Jews uh, on notorious occasions rejected Jew side peace initiatives from their Arab neighbors. I write about what the first Prime Minister of Israel called cruel Zionism. And you can read okay, the book. Right, so you can read the book. Okay, so we might go to our first question. Could this gentleman yeah. here? Which are, yeah. Okay, and make sure it's a question. Okay. okay I, I won't ask him if there's any Palestinians who would dare criticise the Palestinian Authority or, or Hamas, but that's another story. Okay, uh, my question is for Yusuf. There's a myth that uh, when the Jews came to uh, what is now Israel, that there was some sort of Palestinian country or a nation. Um, I'd like to know uh, what was the capital uh, of this Palestinian country? What was the flag? What did it look like? What was their currency? Who was their leader? And what was the language? Okay. That's, a good, that's a good question. I know uh, that's a very good question. The Palestinian flag dates back 
1917, when the Grand Revolution, uh, Grand Arab Revolution, adopted the t t today's flag, and then when they went to the Hashemites from Hejaz to Jordan, and then the Palestinians joined the, the Hashemite kingdom in an attempt to make an independent state that also included Iraq. You know the Hashemites were in Iraq as well, and there were also hopes that the Hashemites would rule Syria, but that didn't happen. So the flag dates back to 1917. The capital was Jerusalem and will always be. And I also, my, my, the, the, grandfather, the grandfather of my father, Ahmad al-Rimawi, was appointed by the, Turkish, by the Turkish rulers to teach in Damascus, and the contract that he was sent uh, uh, it, it clearly states that Palestinians going to the Damascus region. So Palestine, um, um, of course, there are issues of, of history. There are issues of history. All right, but, so, but you but, have answered the question. Thank okay. you. All right. Um, do we have a question from this side? This is a question to the panel about common ground. Because that, that the bishop mentioned common ground was a key thing. And my question is to the panel: Why can't you this evening find enough common ground to talk about this, as your leaders are? When we talk about, and I look at the South African situation, when President de Klerk sat down with Nelson Mandela, they, they, they didn't argue like this, they found common ground. They just buried Martin McGuinness in Northern mm. Ireland. I was a British soldier in Northern Ireland, mm. and yet I've seen you know, the Reverend Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness in Parliament laughing together. Mm. They found mm. common ground, and I find it dispiriting, to be honest, that you as a panel, so the question was asked, couldn't find enough common ground, and you know, and I guess it comes back Okay, to so maybe side. we'll get people to respond to this. All right, thank you. So we did say uh, we hold it up until the end. Okay, do you want to respond, Nadia? What yes, I made it very clear that if we put religion aside, we will find common ground. That's number one. Common ground is to actually live in peace. That's number two. Let's agree that we need to live in peace, and I wonder, um, uh, if the Palestinians are open to actually live in peace, if they have been through all, all the problems, all the poverty, all the discrimination, all of this, I think they would need to live in peace. The land is so huge that it can be shared, but the in, in insisting on Jerusalem, I wonder why. That's why let's put religion aside and sit down and talk about living in peace as one to another. Thank you. Okay. Maybe, Ron, like uh, Hamas this week just uh, made, uh, agreed that they were no longer committed to the destruction of Israel. Did you see that as a positive step? Um, in fact, they didn't say that. <laughs> They've just uh, said today in a statement that their charter, which says that wherever you find a Jew behind a tree, or behind a stone, kill him. And that was reiterated by their leader just today, that's to make sure there's no misunderstanding. So this business about not being religion is hogwash. Mm -hmm. who's, who's the leader? In Hamas? Yeah. The leadership, I... Oh, uh, give me the name. Well, they've got a new guy there now. The new guy, does he have a name? Yeah, yeah, I can't remember his name, but I remember... Oh, you can't remember, okay, that's it's enough. It's not a point. That's so, enough. No, I no, mean, no. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a very important point, because you he's know what? You know what? No, I don't know okay. what. Okay. I, know. Know. I, I think so I might get uh, I know. George to um, respond to this question about common ground. ground. We're, we're struggling to find yeah. it. No, yeah. no, I, I agree. Hang on a second. Yeah. I do agree there needs to be common ground, mm. but I, I would like it to be uh, based on, on, on some basic intellectual and moral um, integrity and unfortunately this is not what's been happening here and it doesn't happen there either and um, as far as the IR, you know the Irish uh, con uh, situation is concerned I just want to remind you that um, it's not the same situation and that the, um, the Palestine Liberation Organization was involved in the killing of Mount Batten um, Charles's uncle and they're also involved in training with um, the Red Brigade with the Bader Meinhof gang so I don't think it's just as, as, um, as simple as everybody else makes it to be. Okay. But having said that, I would like it to be common ground with no religion involved. Mm -hmm. But that can happen, I'm not so That's sure. Right. Um, Bishop Browning, do you very want to respond to that? Very grateful for your question. I think it's the most important question here. Uh, to start with, I was hoping we wouldn't be two over here and two over here. I mm -hmm. would prefer the seating to be not so conflictorial in its setting, number one. Number two, I, I wasn't expecting what we've just heard in the last speech is the same of, of uh, sort of intimidating statements about people and it's very difficult to get common ground when there are um, disparaging statements made about the other side if that's the right, right way of putting it and I, I, 
I believe that I, I don't think religion is involved in this dispute. That's my view, and um, because uh, part, partly because I've come to grips with the idea, which is difficult because I've been a professional religious person most of my life, that the Jews, on the whole, don't understand themselves as religious people. They understand the Jewish description to be an ethnic, a cultural, a traditional kind of identity, not, not a religious identity. No, so no. That, that's what I've been told by, by, by uh, the, many of the leaders of the Jewish community, wrong. by um, wrong. etc. But maybe they're wrong, okay, but that's what I've been told. Okay. But also, um, with the Arabs, they don't, as we just heard from Yusuf, don't consider themselves to be primarily Islamic or primarily Christian, they identify as Palestinian. And I think the, there is imputation of religion from the audience, which actually is not the reality. Do you want to talk about, the, the, respond to the question of common ground, Yusuf? What's that? I think the starting point is to look for the reformists and moderates within any political party, within any ideological stream or school of thought. And if you really want to achieve a solution, empower the moderates and reformists and do not polarize the situation. Because what we have heard today uh, is a polarization. Uh, and and, and uh, when you attack, let, let's say, uh, when you attack, uh, when, 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 you, when you refer to a moderate and you start saying that your Quran or your religion and your prophet, of course you're going to radicalize that person. If you really want to achieve good results, you have to stop the double standards. We have heard Israel for, for, for years criticizing Hamas for the charter, and when they actually reform the charter, there's no any single reference from Quran in, in their charter, and they actually accepted the 67 borders, which is a huge advancement. And also, they, they, there's no any, and they clearly stated, they clearly stated that the conflict is not without Jews. It is, it's a political conflict. And if you really want to dismiss that, uh, you are, you're not going to achieve any results. So the, the starting point to achieve any result is to empower moderates and reformists and to welcome and to stop the double standards. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, let's start a question over here. Thank you, Noam. Yeah. Hold the clapping, thanks. Thank we'll have you. to answer that later. Uh, I'd like to address my question to the pro-Palestinian uh, speakers. All the, the Palestinian media, their textbooks talk about replacing Israel with an Islamic State. Now, wouldn't you think it would be a really good idea if all they did was change that as a gesture of good faith in, in, in attending a, a, to a peaceful resolution of the, the conflict? Can I answer? Mm, sure. uh, I'm sorry, can I answer? Do you understand Arabic? Do you, how do you say all the Palestinian media? Well, we saw um, video clips earlier. But that's not all. That's snippets. That's taken out of context. Oh. I, I, I watch, I watch Palestinian media. I watch Palestinian. Do you watch Palestinian media, Nadia? Yes, I do. Which channel? Which channel? Yeah, Palestinian media. I, I read the media. I don't watch which, channels. Which newspaper? I beg your pardon? Which, which newspaper? I read Al Haya. I read a lot of them. We don't have Al Haya. You don't have Al Haya? No. Okay. What, what, what newspaper do you read? Egyptian, Egyptian one, isn't it? Al Haya. Al Haya is London based. It's not Palestinian. Do you read any Palestinian, Palestinian media outlet? Yeah. The question, the question no, is not even to you, you Yusuf. No, 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 no. Okay, no. Okay. You're so, having the so, right. So, no, so I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm going to no, stop there. Bernie, no, no, I don't no, accept I, that I have you been attacked. No, no, no. You accuse me. You, you accuse me. No, 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 no. 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 Okay, no. but listen. No, You've no, got a question answer, a question from the floor. You answer the question. Don't direct the question back to me. Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I so will the, admit that this we need to all the media. This is a huge okay, statement. Thanks, and the, what I'm saying, what I'm saying, no, that the Palestinian yes, media, yeah. that the Palestinian media uh, has nothing to do with with, yeah. with with what you have described. I really genuinely invite you to ask people who watch the Palestinian media, whether the Palestine national television or even the Hamas. Those those Palestinians in the room who know me, they know that I'm very critical of Hamas. And they know that I, if anything, I would support Fatah. But I will tell you that Hamas television, Al-Aqsa, has no anti-Semitic uh, elements. Has, they could have maybe, maybe um, a narrow political view, but there's no elements of anti-Semitism today. And I really want the proof, if there is anyone, and I will promise to take it further 
from my own channels with the Palestinian Authority and protest because anti-Semitism hurts me as much as it hurts you. It's not, it's not an issue. I mean, we Palestinians don't think that the Palestinians celebrate Holocaust. We, still, we know that Holocaust is the biggest crime in the 20th century. But there is difference between, between, between sympathizing with Holocaust and, with, and saying that, yes, the fact that you have occupied my land, kicked me out, and now I have to live in, in statelessness, and, uh, and, and prevented me from all human rights, I understand. Okay, all right, we'll, we'll stop there. So, so there's no, there's no, there's no, there's no, textbooks, the school, there is nothing, yeah. school textbook. I challenge that. Okay. If you, if you have right, so you can, you you can, can uh, so Yusuf, but Yusuf is uh, very um, prominent in the media. You can send stuff to him yeah, yeah, please, and, please and make it available. I'm serious. Put it up on a Facebook. What do Mamri? Memory, it's in Israel. Memory. 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 Check this one. You'll find it. Memory is not Palestinian outlet. No, no, what do you mean? It's an Israeli who watches the Palestinian media. Watches. Okay, all right. Okay. okay. Thank, thank you. But this is no, I, I, I want to encourage people to continue on to, to talk about these things. Um, yeah, and, 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 and I, I, have, I have a poll here. Yeah. There is actually a recent poll by... by the support of ISIS yeah. is, is less than 4%. Okay, right. that's, that's according to the poll. Right. Can you please not keep talking over everyone? I'm, I'm, I'm answering. You're interrupting. No, I'm not okay. interrupting. Right. You, you, you are interrupting. interrupting. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Right. Can you, uh, right. you Cynthia? Uh, right. Would you, have you got a question on this side? Yeah. Please. My understanding is that the Palestinian people, or Palestine, in fact comes from the name from the Romans and the Philistines, who came from the areas of the Aegean and Crete. They were not Arabs. They were never Palestinians more than uh, 500 years ago. You have no artifacts, you have no, nothing to show of a history. We asked you, a leader, a king. You talk about Jerusalem. You don't even mention it in the Quran. We mention it 634 times. And you're telling us that we are Judaizing Jerusalem. It doesn't belong to you. It belongs to you and me and uh, the bishop and everybody. But Yerushalayim is a Hebrew name. We created it. Everything in our land went to Jerusalem. The festivals, the people, the land represented the Jews. And Jerusalem was the core. Okay, do you there were no Palestinians. Question? It's a fabricated history. And right. question, uh, would, you, would you like to have a question that you want to ask, or you take that as a statement? Um, yes. I'd like you to give me your Palestinian history, please. Okay. Well, um, it's not an issue of history. It's an issue of human rights. You have 50 oh. records. Oh. One second, come yeah, on. Please, please. You please. have 50, 50, 50 quiet, years yeah. record. Uh, uh, Jerusalem has been... I mean, we can't debate history for hours and hours. And mm -hmm. we say, but by the way, you said Jerusalem is not mentioned in Quran. Well, that's not true. But let's not go there. Subhanallah, the asra bi'abdi layla min al-masjid al-harami ila al-masjid al-aqsa. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Uh, yes, we can talk about the history, we can talk about Quran and Bible, we can talk Please about the, the about roots, but what's, what's skirting, more important... What, no, 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 okay, if, well, had, no, no, thank you. Please. Had, 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 had our occupation been from an Islamic country, we would have resisted it the same. If Jordan occupied Palestine or Algeria or Morocco, well, you would have seen the same level of resistance. No, I've asked you about if, your if history. they have given us not the same level of treatment, Please that's not answer about your okay. history. That's right. the question. But, but, but why, do you, why do you dismiss the important, which is affecting people's lives, which is human rights violations? Mm -hmm. You have 50 years record of you human rights violations. You are not answering right. my question. All right, I think we've, we've done that. Have we got, has anybody got a question they'd like to ask someone on this top side of the table? I have Behind. a question for uh, Bishop Brown and uh -huh. Yusuf. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's two questions, but I will be... I'll let you only ask one. <laughs> you will ask yeah, I'll let you ask one. Yeah. All right. Bishop, can you give me statistics about the Christian in Jerusalem and what happened to them? Okay, so you wanted like a historical figure or a current figure? No. 
statistics now. So, okay, all right. Yep. Since yeah. 48. It's, all right, since 48. Now. Okay, all right. So do you know the well, figures? Well, in, in round figures, the, the Christian community in what we would call Greater Palestine was between a, a quarter and a third of the population in the, 20, in the early part of the 20th century, but it's now almost uncountable. It's reduced so much. So Why? That it, Why? 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 Because... For two or three for reasons, business and, business. and one, one of the reasons is economic, and that is that if you can move away from a situation and you can actually have a better econ economic situation somewhere else you'll move, and it, the, the reality is it's easier, easier for the Christian community to move than it is for the Islamic community to move because of their connections with the West. And um, it's what uh, we have a... My church, the Anglican Church, has a, an Anglican bishop in Jerusalem, it's in George's. And um, we have a number of parishes there, and they appeal to us all the time in the West, please, 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 please don't encourage any more of our people to leave and come to you, um, because we need them there. And uh, I agree very much that the, the Christian population has continued to decrease. There are still significant Christian leadership, like Hannah Ashwari, for example, is, mm. is a Christian mm. um, and one of the m more prominent Palestinian leaders, member you know, of the executive you know committee. Who is her, her husband? I, sorry? Do you know Hannah Ashwari, who is her husband? No, I don't think I do. All right. Can you search about that? Sure. Okay. Or, right. or you can just tell us. You can tell us. Can you tell me, do you know, how many Christians in Gaza? Uh, can I answer uh, that others. question? Can I answer that question? What happened, do you know, to okay, the... Uh, say, yeah, um, uh, what no, happened, yeah, what, because what you're okay. debating that is right, no so religion. Is a, you've, you've asked okay. a question, and we're just looking for answers, so do you want to answer the question? Um, up to a few years back, there was 3,000 Christians. Today, count is about 1,300. Okay, all right. Why? Okay, all right, so a question here for someone on this table, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, okay. This question... Very much yeah, I want him and then come back to you, yeah. Can I answer this question? Or, uh, yeah, oh, which, one, which one? The one about the Christians? In one minute, in yeah. one minute. In one minute, all right, minute. I'll give you 30 seconds. On this issue, yep. I want you to look up the churches of Amwas and Kaniset el Maskobiya church, and also the roof of the Holy Sepulchre church. This uh, Amwas was set on fire and destroyed by settlers. And the, the, Zion, the Zion Temple Church last year also was attacked by, uh, by settlers and were protected by so by, by So what people. I'm saying is that when you continue to attack churches, when you prevent the people from accessing their holy sites, when you turn their life into hell, they will look for options. And the, the statistics has fallen from 30% to less than 5%, I understand. Okay. Right. But it's because, solely because of occupation. Because okay. if, they, if it was because so, of... So, 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 so
approximately 90% of the Palestinians, not necessarily in terms of territory, in terms of people. So the two things that confuse me is you talk about the lack of electricity. If they paid the bills, which amount to tens of millions, that would automatically go through. Okay. okay, I'll have to try and talk a bit louder to, to be okay. Um, and, and, and it's just a part of it I'd like to know. If it is, the, if the Palestinians live under apartheid rule, then surely it's the Palestinian authorities, so why blame Israel? And the last part of that question is really another issue of confusion that I am faced with, okay. and that is uh, with regard to the hostages that were held by the Palestinians when they took the Israeli okay. uh, well, thing. Why did they take the peace-loving people who are only interested in land and rights, take Israelis as hostages? Okay, all right. Do you want to respond to that, uh, Bishop Browning, as much as you can hear? <laughs> It's very difficult to characterize from the, from the extremes and uh, if I can sh you can show me that uh, you can show me that Palestinians have taken Jew Jews as hostages I can show, show you uh, I'm talking about the Olympics Oh, oh right, right. sent me to yeah, Munich uh, yeah. when uh, you blame uh, the Israelis for killing and mm. the, the, the Munich police my question I is I'm uh, 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 okay, okay, uh, yeah. all right okay, okay thank you you made uh, you made your point no, no, I, I just want to explain why he questioned what I right, said. Right, okay, sure. Mm -hmm. And if they were never taken as hostages, there was no need to kill anybody. Mm -hmm. and okay. Well, right, okay. Yeah. Do, do you want me to respond to the Munich issue? The Munich issue, no, no, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Do you, uh, First of all, the issue of land. Israel accepted the principle of land for peace. So there's no point to, uh, asking Israel not to accept this principle because it's been 30 years of negotiation on this principle of land for peace. Second, speaking of land, I want, uh, if, if anybody has been to Jerusalem and you know Ben Yehuda Street, or you know, uh, for example, uh, the Yaffa Street, this street uh, is a confiscated uh, uh, property, of, a private property of a Tanus uh, family. So it's not an issue of Jordan uh, illegally controlling the land. What about the confiscated uh, private properties that Israel took from the Palestinian owners? And in this case, it's the Christian oh, Palestinians. So you're, you're not so, responding to so the, the issue. Land, no, the, land, no, the, no, the land, the Please land. Please answer the question. So it's asking, you, you made the claim that uh, the Jewish security, security forces had killed the, um, no, the hostages. The, the Munich, okay, yeah. first of all, I don't think, I don't, I disagree with armed struggle in there. So you have to know that the starting point is that we are with popular struggle, we are with boycott divestment, we are with diplomatic pressure, we are with any non-violent means of resistance. So if you want to drag me back to 1972, during the time where PLO and Israel exchanged assassinations, we can talk about that later. But it's no longer current, it's no longer valid. Okay, okay. all right, good. Um, Bishop Brown, do you want to respond to that? Is the question about Israel that he'd asked there about, so why, was, why did the uprising or the opposition, well, <laughs> I, I blame the Russians. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the, the issue about why Israel, oh, sorry, why did, there was no uprising when Jordan was ruling over um, the West Bank uh, and then it suddenly happened after Israel took over. Yeah. Well, there is a misunderstanding really in terms of setting things in relation to the authority of a state, be it Jordan or whatever. The reality is that, um, for example, there's a, a Palestinian family in, in Sydney who actually have the legal title, goes back four or five generations to their land mm -hmm. and that has been confiscated without, without recompense and uh, it's be, simply, be, you can actually see, I've seen photographs of it, the guy's uh, Palestinian name still mm -hmm. slightly visible at the top of the property um, and this, the, the Palestinians constantly are having their houses removed and their, 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 their vineyards cut down, etc., etc., etc. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. It's not so much what the state has done, it's that individual people have had to become, uh, had to become um, landless 
Property-less hmm. uh, people. That's the right, issue. Yeah, okay. right. Next I think question. This is the last question Next we're question. going to have. No, no, we've got to have. No, we've got to have. Excuse me. Got, no. We had, you had, you had, we had two. No, no, no. Two and then you can be the last one. Okay. Are you happy to have the last word? Yeah, sure. Good. Smile. Yeah, go for it. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. I've got a nice, easy, non-emotional question. Yeah. Um, I've read it. Some people have said that modern Jews and Jews of the first century have no kinetic, um, sorry, um, genetic connection. If you are refuting that, or I should say, to refute that, can you give me the evidence that proves beyond reasonable doubt that there is that connection? So, sort of, give me references, I don't mind. Well, well the, 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 the Jews are the indigenous people of Judea and Samaria and are tied to the land for thousands of years. The writings in the um, the Mesha Seal, for instance, makes reference from 2,800 years ago to the house of David, which is King David. From that's 2,800 years ago. Um, you also got the, um, for instance, the Dead Sea Scrolls from 2,000 years ago that were discovered. Every Israeli child can read them. No Palestinian child can read them. The Ball of Pilgrim Festivals are tied to the land, tied to the. Um, to, to, to Jerusalem. In fact, Jesus went to um, Jerusalem uh, for the Pilgrim Festival. Can I ask, can I interrupt? Yeah? Yeah. My question was modern Jews to first century Jews, not from first century back. So the, the evidence that proves beyond reasonable doubt, like in a legal sense, that modern Jews are actual Jews. There have been DNA studies done in the United States and Israel, but in Jewish um, tradition, Jewish law, it's not about a genetic thing, it's about a belief system. And um, you get anybody can become Jewish if they subscribe to Jewish law. It's, Pardon? That's all right. Yeah, no, no, that's right. Yeah. Excuse me. Palestinian. Palestinian. Some, some Palestinians, Palestinians have become okay. Jewish. Oh, why don't they all convert then? Why would you? Excuse me. Let me finish. Thank you. Every, 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 excuse me. Every Israeli child. All right, please stand. As I said before, every Israeli child can read the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's in Hebrew. But Palestinian children can't even pronounce their own country's name because the word Palestinian and Palestine is not even an Arab name. It's not even a they they can't pronounce it. Okay. Right, so one, one, one final one, question, one, and then we'll pack up. Yeah. We Abba Eben famously said that the Palestinians never missed an opportunity to, to miss yeah. an opportunity. Um, I would say at the same time that the Israelis that would apply equally to the Israelis. Um, I noticed Dr. Power uh, made a disparaging remark before about uh, Donald Trump, and I understand where he's coming from. I'm not a big fan of Donald Trump's. Nevertheless, Donald Trump says he's, he has a prime purpose now to try to create peace in the Middle East. He's met with Abbas. He's met with Netanyahu. Um, I don't know where it's going. I don't know what the chances are of him pulling this off. Um, does the panel have there a view? Does, yeah, does the panel have a view about whether we can actually get peace and find some sort of common ground there when I haven't seen any common ground coming up at all tonight? No. Yeah. At all. That's a, a very good question to end off with. Okay, so I'll get you all to respond on this. We talked a little bit about the common ground issue before, okay? Um, yeah, so maybe, yeah, what would be a next step? If you had a, a next step, say you were there at the meeting, what would you suggest to these three men? Well, the Palestinians wanted a state in uh, the 1967 borders, mm -hmm. and that is the least they can accept, because this is 22% of historical Palestine. Mm -hmm. So to have a state, it means that there, there, there will be no Jewish or Israeli settlers, and we'll have to have sovereignty over our borders, and we have to have a state. So uh, I think what is feasible is to walk in that favor, because if the two-state solution continues to fall apart, because it's nearly dead, if, 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 if it's not dead, uh, then the outcome will not be a, po a positive uh, outcome, neither for the Palestinians nor for the Israelis. Okay, all right. Do, do you want to respond? What would be a next step? Yeah. What would you suggest? Yeah. Donald Trump brings you up and says, um, uh, Bishop Browning, uh, what should I do? What are you going to tell him? It's a very good question. It's a very good question. And I think that 
if there is to be peace, there has to be peace because the Israelis see there is something they want to be an advantage for Palestinians and Palestinians want to see an advantage for Israelis. Unless there is actually some way in which both sides see themselves as benefiting, then if one's a winner takes all and the other is the great loser, mm. of course there can never never be peace. So it's actually, I think I would be, if I was, if I was uh, Trump, I would be asking both leaders, do you actually want there to be common ground? Mm. Unless there is a desire for common ground, there can't be common ground. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, Ron. Um, despite a, a first step, what would you suggest well, to President despite, Trump? Despite it not being religious, you did say Jewish settlers, okay? Yeah. Now, the next thing I want to just point out is that I think that peace will come when the Palestinian people who have been mistreated, abused, lied to, and cheated by their own leadership will say, enough's enough. We don't want our leaders running away all the way to the bank and collecting their millions and billions when they love their own children more than what they hate Israelis. And when they um, have come to that conclusion that they're not going to win any wars and that it's futile, it's a waste of life, it's a waste of their lives, and that their tragic situation is going to be alleviated when they realize that their re leaders have cheated and lied to them for generations. Because it's not about the 67 war, because before the 67, what you call borders, there was also no peace. So why wasn't there peace before 67? It's not about that. 10 seconds. Okay. Right. 10 seconds. Yeah, no, no. Um, okay. uh, Nadia, L last word. You last get word. Yep. Mm -hmm. I am going to agree with Bishop George there that yes, I will get the two, um, two leaders and get them to sit down and get it from them if they really want common ground. If they don't, then there will not be peace. Simple. Mm -hmm. okay. sit down. All right. Um, we will just finish up there. When I was asked to take on this job, I thought in rugby league, this is called a hospital pass. Um, I looked at the people on there and I thought, this isn't going to um, be a fun evening. But we've actually talked about some really significant issues. And as I mentioned before, this is not common. We're often we're getting people who are talk there, people may listen to Yusuf show uh, and they all agree, agree, agree. They may, may listen to Nadia and they agree, agree, agree. And it's been great to have you all in the same room together. I'd like to commend you on your relatively good behaviour. I'll give you a C plus. <laughs> just. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for being part of it. This is just a first step, uh, a part of an annoying conversation. We've been able to sit in the same room together. We've been able to talk about really painful and difficult uh, situations, and we know that there will be um, a continuing, a continuing dialogue hopefully going on. So let's give a big a round of applause to uh, our panelists. And we have about three minutes to vacate this room. There are some pamphlets up the back there that are for free. There's some books for sale. They're my books, so please buy them as you go out um, and have a good rest of the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bernie.